Welcome to session one of the lace insertion and lingerie couture techniques class. I am your teacher, Maddie Kulig. Uh, most of you in this live session already are familiar with Madeline, but for anybody who is listening afterwards or watching the recording afterwards, um, a brief lowdown of Madeline and what we slash I do. Um, we offer uh, DIY lingerie kits lingerie sewing patterns. We will be offering ready-made sewing patterns with a little lingerie twist on them later this year. We do bra making workshops both here in person in Philadelphia as well as online and we do ready-made lingerie. What does ready-made lingerie mean? It means that if you are a DIYer and you and your your uh, significant other or your family member or whoever loves what you're making but you don't want to make it for them, I don't blame you. We have a team of sewists who will make it for you. Um, in this class, we are going to be going over uh, lace insertion, which is the process of like inserting a lace into a design. Uh, on this example here, it is just um, at the top edge of the S9729, but there are so many uh, possibilities and variations. You could insert it here, you could insert it here, you could insert it anywhere. So at the end of the class, at the end of the third session, what I want you to do is I want you to feel less intimidated about lace insertion. I feel like uh, lace insertion, couture lingerie, couture nightwear, sleepwear, whatever you're sewing, is equal parts intimidation and excitement. You really want to do it. You love the idea, but you're like, whoa, I don't even know where to start. Where do I get my fabrics? What thread do I use? What pattern? So I want to clear all that for you and give you the knowledge as well as the confidence and like the sojo um, to do it yourself. But what makes this class so different? so so different is that Elma from Elma Laundry, which if you aren't familiar with Elma Laundre, I go check her out because you will ooh and ah over all of her stuff. Um, I've actually known Elma for a few years now before I got into the DIY, like before, when I first started making lingerie. I just loved her stuff. Um, she does a lot of petite stuff so for smaller busted. Um, people, but her techniques are amazing and very inspiring. So she will be joining this second session um, to give her techniques, uh, little tips and tricks. Uh, she's actually taken some couture classes, so she's going to give you some insight into just different couture techniques. For session run, I'm a person who likes to know the game plan before I actually start the game. So. Uh, game plan for these three sessions is that today, don't worry, you don't need anything prepared. I just want you to sit back to soak in all the information. Um, I'm going to be going over different fabrics, uh, different elastics, uh, some, some uh, suggestions on where to buy uh, different, just online, um, different vendors. Um, there is a class handout and I highly suggest that you look at the designers that I put in there. Um, just as like inspiration for it's really awesome to check them out. Um, then I'll be going over tools that you um, that I recommend. Um, do you need a special sewing machine? Do you what type of thread to use? And then the last part, I'm going to cut out the bodice portion of the S9729. I don't expect you to do it with me, um, but in between uh, the first session and the second session. Um, I do expect, to, if you want to join the next session, then you can cut it out. Um, but you don't have to cut out right now. Um, you are more, you, if you are a type of person that, like me, I like to watch, digest, and then do myself, you can watch all three sessions and just kind of like sit back, relax, and then after the sessions, you can um, join in or, or not join in, but do it yourself. Um, at your own pace, on your own time. A lot of sewists do get uh, very um, nervous when they are under the pressure of time, and I don't want you to feel nervous at all. The first thing that I want to go over, um, I'm gonna be switching cameras um, and doing a look down of the fabrics and the elastics and the cutting. Now before I get to that, um, I'm gonna be jumping around in your handout. Um, two things that I want to discuss before I go into the look down is what makes couture lingerie or couture 
actually couture. And then do you have to sew hand sewing versus machine sewing? Like does couture have to be hand sewn? Um, and is that okay for lingerie? So two things that I want to uh, answer before hopping over to the look down. One is what makes couture couture. Um, uh, the word couture uh, gives off like the connotation and you immediately think like, oh my God, I can't sew couture. Couture means that I have years and years of experience of sewing and I hand sew everything and that's couture. But by definition, couture just means custom made. Um, so you don't have to work in, a, in an atelier in Paris, that would be awesome if you did, um, but you don't have to work in an atelier in Paris to call your stuff couture. Um, as long as it's custom made, which if you're DIYing or sewing on your home machine, it is custom made. If it's not from a manufacturer, it's custom made, it, it's considered couture. Um, so I wanna give you the confidence to use that term, throw it out there. Be like, yeah, I made couture. Um, and then also, difference between hand sewing and machine sewing. Um, again, the word couture um, gives off the connotation or, or people immediately think that if it's couture, it's hand sewn. Um, and that if it's hand sewn, it's a little bit better than machine sewn. Not always the case. Um, I get a lot of questions when people, especially with, um, brides to be um, and when they're scheduling their bachelorettes, they ask, you know, can we do this by hand? And you know what? I love I love a, a good DIY project where I can do it by hand, but when it comes to bras and undies and bodysuits, we want those back stitches. We want those machine tacks. We don't want things falling out around here. So I would suggest you can, listen, my, one of my models is you do you boo. You do you boo, but I would suggest using a machine um, and getting those secure stitches um, so that we don't have anything spilling out or popping out or having like a Janet Jackson moment um, on Super Bowl. So that is my recommendation. Let's go on to fabrics, elastics, um, and cutting out the S9729 bodice portion. Um, as a referral, this is the handout that I that comes with the class and that I will be going along with. Um, so don't feel like you have to take any, well, you can take notes, um, but everything that I'm saying is in this handout. All right, so let's go over fabrics. The first one, most common type of fabric that you think of when you think of couture is silk fabrics. And here's a little card um, that I have that goes over all the different types of silk fabrics. They have a lot of different types of variety, which I will get into after I go over like the main fabrics. Um, it comes in charmeuse, there is silk chiffon, there is crinkled chiffon, there is double georgette, there's four ply crepe, uh, there's crepe back satin, silk organza, china silk, silk, crepe de chine, um, stretch silk charmeuse, regular silk charmeuse. Um, so these are the type of silks. Immediately when you think of silks, you think of luxury. It is a great fabric um, to work with when it comes with couture sewing. Uh, the thing about uh, silk is that it is very difficult to work with. It's very difficult to cut. It's very difficult to sew. But that's why you're taking this class. Um, and I'm hoping to give you the tips and techniques um, in order to make your sewing life a little more enjoyable. Um, the next type of fabric is velvet, which I don't actually have an example of velvet, but it's a pretty common fabric that you immediately know what velvet is. Now with velvet, um, velvet can be used for nightwear, it can be used for um, lingerie. Usually when it's in lingerie, it's a stretch uh, fabric. Um, we actually had a uh, style a couple years ago with a burnt uh, emerald green velvet. And just velvet always just gives a, gives a connotation of warm, um, very luxurious. Um, it's used a lot in robes. Uh, they pair like a kimono robe that has lace detailing with um, a velvet like body. Um, the next type of fabric is beaded. Now you don't usually see this in lingerie um, unless it's for some sort of dance wear or like burlesque uh, type of performance. Um, but it is used a lot in couture, uh, just couture uh, nightwear. Not nightwear, but if you're wearing couture 
um, let's just say you're wearing the S9729 not as nightwear but as outerwear, that's when you see a lot of beaded um, things uh, made. Um, beaded is very hard to work with because when you're dealing with beaded fabrics um, and you have a seam, uh, normally uh, the rule is that you will take out the beads from the seam and then sew the seam uh, so that you don't break a needle. I don't know how to, who has time for that. Um, and usually uh, when we actually have been working on a new jumpsuit and we had not a bead but a sequin, um, we just sewed over right over those sequins. Um, and the other one is cashmere, which I don't have an example of, but it's a really common fabric. Um, cashmere actually is used a lot in underwear. It provides like a really warm layer, um, especially in wintertime. It also gives off a really cozy uh, vibe. Cashmere is very expensive, so that's why uh, when you think of cashmere um, in couture, they go hand in hand, um, and that cashmere um, is a couture fabric. Um, and any of these can be used for lingerie or for nightwear. Now, types of silks. Silks come in so many different varieties. Um, the one that came with your DIY kits uh, are the, is a silk charmeuse. And it's a lighter weight uh, charm, uh, silk. Um, a great, since you're going to be buying a lot of stuff online, you might be lucky in that you have a vendor locally that does um, offer different types of silks. A great uh, way to determine a silk's weight is asking for their GSM, which is their grams per square meter. So the lighter the GSM, let's just say it's 60 GSM um, versus 120 GSM, 120 is going to be a little bit thicker, more opaque. The 80 GSM is going to be a little bit um, a little bit lighter um, and even see-through, uh, which this silk chiffon, which is a really uh, thin fabric, um, is like a, I think it's like a 60 GSM. The vendor, whoever you're buying from, usually will have this available if you're buying it from them. Um, silk Charboose is great. That's what's used in all your DIY kits uh, for this class. It comes in the uh, regular, which is the non-stretch, as well as a stretch. If you're someone who has big hips and it's you, since the DIY slip um, doesn't have a closure, you might want to consider getting a stretch uh, Silk Charboose because that will help you get it over your hips um, if you're pulling it on from, from the bottom. Um, or if you have a bigger bust, um, and it's really hard to pull things over your bus, suggest it, I suggest getting a silk charmeuse versus a regular charmeuse. And charmeuse is kind of like the standard weight, um, whereas silk chiffon, uh, crinkled chiffon, georgette are lighter weights. If you use these types of silk, you will, it'll probably be see-through, um, which is, it, that's, that's totally fine if you want a see-through, um, uh, robe or a slip, you can definitely use silk chiffon. Um, there's charmeuse, uh, there's chiffon, I'm just going through your handout. There's georgette, which georgette I would consider like one up from chiffon. Um, so it's a little bit more opaque, it's not as sheer. Um, and then satin, all right, so here's a color card with stretch satin. Stretch satin, of, or it's just satin. It, it can come in stretch or non-stretch. It usually has a shiny side and a non-shiny side. The thing about satin is that it, has a, it usually has a little bit more structure. So this looks very similar, especially on camera. It looks very similar to uh, silk charmeuse, but it's a little bit heavier. So if you want something with a little bit more structure to it, you might consider a satin or a crepe back satin um, versus a silk chiffon. Also, if you have trouble sewing through thin layers of fabric, whether it's your machine or you just don't have a lot of experience, satin is a little bit easier to sew through than um, uh, charmeuse or chiffon or georgette. Um, the other type of fabric is organza. Um, and organza is I would use organza mostly for adding body. Um, if you have a sheared skirt, uh, if you have, um, let's just say, also a bodice that needs like a very structured but lightweight lining to it, that's usually when organza is used. Um, organza, I don't see a lot um, 
used as a main fabric but more as a lining fabric and to adding body in a design. I also suggest, because a lot of these fabrics, especially when holding them up here, they look very similar. Um, and if you're watching this, you're like, that doesn't look any different than this. Um, reach out to the vendor and ask them if they have a color card like this. Um, because seeing it in person, uh, you can tell that the chiffon is sheer versus the four-ply silk, which is a lot heavier weight. Alrighty, types of laces. Um, the first type of lace is all over lace. And the only, the what makes all over lace, all over lace? Now this is a lot. Um, but what makes all over lace, all over lace is that it is usually 45 inches wide, 36 inches wide, maybe even 60 inches wide. So it can come in stretch and non-stretch. Um, but what makes it different than the other types of laces is that um, sometimes it does have a finished edge, which this one does right here. Um, but what makes all of our lace, all of our lace is that it is wider. Um, so it's 36, 45, or 60 inches wide. Now galoon lace, on the other hand, has a finished edge. So all galoon lace means is that it is finished on one or both edges. And you're gonna be buying most of this mostly online. And two things to look for when buying st uh, stretch or non-stretch galoon lace online. One is that you wanna look for the width because a lot of times things on camera look bigger than what they actually are. So uh, stretch galoon lace can come in like an inch wide thickness where if, you're, if you wanna use it for a project such as the S9729, it needs to be at least three, four, five. Um, if you're doing lingerie, I suggest six or seven inches wide. Um, usually the wider that it is, um, the more likely only one side is gonna be finished. Uh, it's still a galoon lace because a galoon lace is one or both sides. Um, but usually if it's about 10, I would even say 11 inches or, or narrower, both edges will be finished. Once you get above 12 inches, 13 inches, and into 20 inches, that's when you only have one side finished. That's galoon lace. The next type of lace is eyelash lace. So eyelash lace, this is the type of lace that is used in your DIY kits, is a type of galoon lace. But it has a little eyelash finish on one edge. And then the other, the last type of lace is goupier. So here is an example of goupier lace. If you have been following Madeline, uh, you will recognize this lace. This is actually the lace that I used to make the bodice of my wedding dress. Um, it has, a, it's really thick. Um, and you would notice or you would recognize Goupier lace as soon as you saw it. Um, this one had a finished edge on it, um, but it is very thick, very heavy. So when you're using it in your designs, uh, think about how this would pair with other fabrics. So if I was pairing this with another fabric for, let's just say an S9729, I would want to use a four ply silk or satin because this heavy lace on top of silk charmeuse or chiffon is gonna be too heavy for it. Um, whereas the other ones, the eyelash laces, the stretch galoon lace that I showed, you could pair it with a lighter weight um, silk charmeuse and they would go together, whereas one wouldn't be um, overtaking the other. Also, this is a great to use at, a, at um, the hemline of uh, a slip such as the S9. S9729, it gives it some weight so that the, the skirt portion will have a nice drape, especially for the long version of the S9729. All right, so those are some lace options. There are so many different types of fabrics that you could use for 
uh, couture or lace insertion, but those are the main ones that I saw. Let's get into elastics, um, which same thing is that there are many, many, many types of elastics. Um, and I'm just giving you a few that you will probably use most often in your uh, lace, or not lace, lingerie uh, sewing. So a few different types of elastic. This is wide band, this is strap elastic, this is panty elastic, and this is pico elastic. So the first one that we will go over is pico elastic. Used a lot in lingerie. If you've made a bra, you will recognize pico elastic. Um, it's used for the majority of your bra sewing. Uh, all pico means is that it has a pico edge on it, and it's a decorative edge, so it should be facing outwards on the finished garment. Um, strap elastic. Now, strap elastic could be used a lot, especially in the 9729. Um, in the uh, example that I will show you in a bit, uh, you will see that the straps are made with self fabric. Um, a little bit of a pain to deal with folding those uh, in half and then in half again. Um, if that's not your jam, if you're like, I'm not, I already spent hours sewing the lace insertion portion. Do not want to do the straps. Um, you can use uh, bra making straps. Um, this is great because it's a lot, It's one, it's a lot quicker, uh, and two, you probably have some rings and sliders that you can make adjustable straps for it. So this is, we use it a lot in our, not in the couture um, slip that we have as an example, but in most of the other slips that we've made for our DIY kits, we just use lingerie straps um, in them. Um, this one is a Pico variety. So again, this was Pico plush back, and this is a strap elastic with a Pico edging on it. So all Pico means is that there's a, a little finished edge on either side, one or either side. Um, panty elastic. So this is a Pico panty elastic. Again, it has a Pico edge. Um, panty elastic is a little bit softer, uh, and it has more stretch than let's say a pico elastic. This is a little bit firmer. The reason being is that you want a softer uh, elastic around your waistline, around your leg line, especially when you go to sit down. If you have an elastic that is um, a little bit firmer, you can feel it. And sometimes it, it does hurt around your leg line, uh, especially when you sit down. So panty elastic usually is a little bit softer um, and is meant for uh, uh, just for panties. When it comes to elastics, uh, generally speaking, every type of elastic has a, uh, an application for it. So if you run out of strap elastic, don't try to use your pico elastic. If you run out of panty elastic, don't try to use your strap elastic. Use it for its intended purpose. Uh, I see a question that popped up, which is great. What is the most expensive version of silk and lace? Um, so two things to consider is one, um, silks can be 100% silk or it can be a poly silk. A lot of people sell poly silks and label at, label it as a silk. Um, so if it's poly, it's going to be 100% cheaper. Not 100%, like it's $0, but it's gonna be a lot cheaper. The thing to uh, remember with uh, silks that are poly uh, based is that they will pucker. Um, and that if you want a really gorgeous seam that, especially a long seam that isn't gonna pucker, spend the extra money and get 100% silk shirt mousse. Um, another thing that's gonna determine how much a silk shirt or any of the silks or laces are, or how wide it is. Usually, silk shirt mousses for ply silks are available in 42, I think it is, 42 inch width. Don't quote me on that, it's somewhere in the 40s, um, or maybe it's 38, but it, it's available in a narrower width. That is going to be cheaper than a 54 inch wide silk charmeuse. And usually with our vendor that we get it from, um, the 42 or whatever it is, is cheaper than the 54. But especially with the S9729, if you wanna make the longer version, you need that 54 inches in order to get the sweep of uh, the pattern on the fabric. Um, same thing with lace. Um, if it's narrower, it's gonna be cheaper. If it's wider, it's going to be uh, more expensive. Um, usually silks that I have seen wholesale, it's usually around 21, 29, 30 dollars. 
Um, so it retail, it can go up to $50. It just depends on what vendor you're buying it from. If it has a print on it, it's gonna be more expensive, um, how wide it is. Um, so that is what's gonna determine what, how expensive they are. But just because if it's, it's expensive does not mean it's better. Um, a lot of times nowadays you find dead stock fabric, um, especially dead stock um, silks um, that are sold to be cheaper, but they're actually very high quality. Um, so just because it's expense, more expensive doesn't mean it's better. Just wanna throw that out there. Um, but great question, thanks for asking that, Stephanie. Um, and the other type of elastic before I get to it is wide band elastic. So this is usually used at the bottom of a bralette or at the waistline of a panty. Um, this, these elastics don't come up a lot, especially in slips and stuff like that. But if you want to use uh, some of these lace couture techniques on a bra or a panty, that's where the elastic comes into play. You will most likely be using elastic in those projects. So I want you to know about uh, elastics. Okay, so there are a few tools um, that I recommend. Um, but before I get to that, first let's go over a sewing machine. Do you need a fancy schmancy sewing machine? Um, I don't recommend using a machine that you got uh, on sale at a big box brand. Um, I don't like to put numbers, just like, uh, just because it's more expensive doesn't mean that it's better. It's also a lot of the user um, techniques as well. But if you're spending anything less than $300 on a machine, it's probably going to have tension issues. It's going to um, give you problems um, when you go to sew finer fabrics. Uh, those types of machines are really for quick mending. Um, if you need to like whip up a cotton, blouse or make pillows or stuff like that. Um, I really recommend spending at least $400, $500 on a machine. Um, if you think about it, if you spend a, if you spend money on a really cheap machine that breaks in a couple months, you'll have to upgrade and buy another machine um, that's a little bit more expensive and you will probably end up buying about or spending about double the amount that you originally planned on. So just make that investment buy a little bit more expensive machine. Um, I highly recommend looking on eBay as well. Uh, finding a used machine that's been you know, refurbished is a great um, option. Um, I love, love, love the FAF Passport 2.0 and 3.0. Um, it retails for about $7.99, but I have seen it on eBay for about like in the 400s, um, which is a great, great, great uh, price for an awesome machine. Uh, when I first started sewing ready-made and the DIY kits, I used that machine solely for solid two years. Um, so you don't need a fancy schmancy machine, but you do need a little bit more than, you do need to spend a little bit more than like $300, $400. Um, thread. Uh, thread that I recommend, thread will depend on two things. It's one, the type of fabric that you're using. Um, so if you're using a, a lighter weight silk um, thread, or a uh, lighter weight thread, you will need to use a smaller needle. Um, in the, in the uh, thread that we use for this class, we use a lightweight uh, thread and you can tell um, with the text, uh, T-E-X. Um, the smaller the text, usually the lighter the, or the thinner the uh, thread. Um, and usually if you look online, it'll say what it should be paired with. It should be paired with a 60 um, needle, it should be paired with a 70 needle or 90 needle or size 10, 8, 12. Um, we use mostly an 8 or a 10 needle, especially sewing through the um, lace portion, which is a little bit thicker. Now, if you're sewing all non-stretch laces and fabrics, you can use a universal, but if you're sewing any fabrics with spandex in it or um, any type of stretch fabrics, I highly recommend using a Microtex or sharp needle. Um, your universal needle will probably skip stitches, um, and that is the last thing that you want. Um, spray adhesive. 
Okay, now we get to my, my jam. If you've taken any of my bra making classes, you know that I love my Otis 505 spray adhesive. I love this thing. Um, and as you can see from my cutting mat, the biggest thing that to consider with the Otis 505 is that it doesn't come up on my needle or my machine. Um, if I do have some residual um, uh, uh, glue on my machine, sometimes it gets on like the bed of my machine. Um, I just have that all purpose cleaner. I just spray a little bit, wipe it down with a sponge and it comes right off. Now the exception is cutting mat. So as you can see from my lovely cutting mat that's a little bit shiny, um, not because that it came that way, but because it has some residual glue on it, it does gum up on my, uh, on our uh, cutting mats. And we cut and sew and cut and sew and cut and sew so much. Yesterday, I cut out about 36 bras for the girls to sew. So we we do a lot here. So the, the fact that it looks like this is actually pretty good. But a tip that I got from one of my students is that she, when she goes to the dry cleaners, she asks for the plastic bags um, that they put the clothes in. And she actually puts it over her cutting mat. She'll spray everything, she'll cut everything out. And when she's done, she'll just throw away the plastic bag. Um, so that's a great tip if you want to uh, preserve your cutting mat. I have just come to the conclusion that we will probably have to buy a new cutting mat every six months because we use it so often. Um, and that's a lot of plastic wasted if we did that for everything that we cut. Um, stabilizer. So a couple of stabilizer options. One is Silk Organza. Um, another one is 15 and your tree coat. Um, this is used a lot in bra making as your liner, um, but you can use this at strap points. Um, you can also use this when you're doing the lace insertion um, to add another layer so that um, it doesn't, uh, because you're working with such, such fine fabric. Sometimes it gets sucked into the feed dogs, but having another very stable but lightweight layer will help. Um, so you can use Silk Organza, 15 and your tree coat. If you come from a bra making background, you will have that in your stash. You can also use stretch mesh, which we will be using to line the bodice portion of the S9729. And then two other really um, handy tools are rotary cutter, Highly recommend a rotary cutter um, when cutting out your pattern and fabric. Um, it just, when you're dealing with such lightweight fabrics, using heavy ginger scissors, it shifts the fabrics, things move. So this is gonna give you the most precise cut. Now again, you can see that it is a little bit dirty, but that's because we actually use the heck out of this. Um, it's well loved, that's, why, that's what I like to consider it. Um, and then the last tool, which these are like my jam. These are like our BFFs here. Uh, we literally will probably give up someone's newborn for this, just kidding, um, duck build scissors. We use this all the time. The girls are constantly stealing them from each other. Um, so this is used a lot. You will use this when you actually sew your lace applique. Um, or your lace insertion to get really close to those stitch lines. Um, again, carrying those heavy eight inch ginger scissors, it's really hard to get really close to that um, where you stitched. Okay, let's get into cutting. Oh, actually before we get into cutting, let's ooh and ah over the finished project. Okay, so I expect a couple gasps. Maybe I'll hear like a big clunk because somebody fell down because they were so enamored by this lace insertion. OMG, look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah, I know, I know. Um, but as you can see, and this, all of this, really all the lace insertion techniques right here is totally up to you. So all we did is we just placed the lace over it and we kind of like planned out our design. Um, so if, depending on the width of your lace, if you have lace that's this wide, you can have the lace insertion going all the way down. Um, now, one of the tips that we have is that um, for the bodice portion of the S9729, we actually, talking about stabilizers, we actually line it with a stretch mesh. Um, 
and that helps give it a little bit more oomph and you don't even notice it. But for the skirt portion, we want that flow, we want it to drape, so we just leave it as one layer of silk shirt mousse. Um, we added a center front seam, that was an oopsie, um, but you don't have to have a center front seam. Um, but as you can see here is that you just do like a little tiny zigzag and then you use your duck build scissors and you just closely cut away your design. But what I love about this is like you can play around with the design too, is that you can do like something asymmetrical, which kind of like starts here and then goes all the way down and then you can actually have it like go onto the skirt. Um, so it's really awesome. And just because, you might be thinking like just because it's like a lace edge here that it has to be used on an edge, but you can actually place like the, the whole galloon lace here Like if you want to start it here and you could just sew here and you could cut out or just sew on your little motifs. Um, now when thinking about planning your lace design, um, you might be thinking like, do I plan it at when it's flat or do I, like before sewing, do I sew it on or do I sew it on afterwards? Um, that will depend on the project. Um, for the S9729, when we sewed it on the bodice, of course we sewed it as, we sewed it, we sewed the bodice first and then added the lace insertion. But what you can do is that you can sew the whole thing up and then add your lace insertion afterwards. Um, so it will depend on your project, but you can sew this whole thing up. And sometimes you just need to visualize. You need to hang this up and you need to say like, where do I want this? Do I want it starting up here? Do I want it starting it below? So it will depend on your final project and what you want. Um, which is the great thing about DIY is that you get to decide. All right, so let's cut the S9729. I'm just going to cut the bodice because the skirt is just a layer of silk charmeuse. You don't need instruction on that. So first thing is that we have our silk charmeuse. I'm gonna cut a little portion of it. So I will be using uh, stretch mesh as my stabilizer. But you could be using silk organza, uh, you could be using 15 in your trico. But I'm using stretch mesh just because uh, we have a lot of stretch mesh here at the studio. So Oda's 505 spray adhesive, how do you use it? And whether you're using stretch mesh, whether you're using stabilizer, another type of stabilizer, I suggest going, I suggest spray basing one layer to the main fabric and then treating them as one. It'll make it a lot easier instead of it shifting and you trying to pin it. So you will spray. And it looks wet right now, but it will dry. And you will lay this over. And you give a nice press and then so the first thing that you're going to want to cut is 
the bodice. You can use whatever weight that you want. Do that for the back. So you'll do both bodice pieces and then you'll do it for the back band as well. Now how you cut out your lace and to con consider your lace insertion. So if you're following along with and you want to make a late or uh, uh, slip just like the S9729, what we did is we laid it over and we're like, how far do we want this to go? What angle do we want this to be? Where are the lace motifs on the lace and how far do I want it to go down? Um, and then what we did was placed our pattern piece over and then kind of thought about how far do I want this to go down. Another thing that you want to consider is that um, at these points, at the center front, as well as at the strap points, you want um, the laces, you want the seam line of the laces to be at a, um, uh, to be at a, the high point. Okay, so you want the strap point as well as the center front to meet at the high point of the scalp, the seam line. So on my pattern piece, you can mark a quarter of an inch in or you mark a quarter of an inch in. Um, now, depending on the width of your scallops, you might not be able to have both of them meet at the uh, high point of the scallop. So you have to determine which one takes precedence. I'm gonna do the strap point, um, gonna take precedent. So I'm gonna cut this out. at this point as well as at this, the center front. I'm gonna, what I do, you can pin mark it or you could fold it back. But depending on how far down you want your design to go, I'm gonna remove this. You can pin mark it, you can draw it with a uh, tailor's chalk, but you can, what we did is we just cut out some more length here. Your pattern piece looks very funky right now, um, but you can kind of pin mark where it's gonna go. So you know it's going to be sewn on here, we're going to stitch down here, and we're going to stitch up here, and then we're going to sit down there. But what you want to do, the gist of what I'm saying, is you want to cut out your pattern piece as normal at the top. And then leave room for where you want your design to go. You can either pin mark it, you can use tailor's chalk, whatever you want to do. But you want to make sure that you cut out your bodice. All of your lace portions will have this extra lace at the bottom to account for your design.